All right. Well, welcome. Um, um, over the last four years, what's been kind of nice is coming to this group and sharing, you know, here's what we did this year. But today, we're really looking backwards with five years of research. And I think your question was really good. We, you know, came in and we said, gee, let's do a baseline and see where we are. And all of our studies, which your question was great too, um, what about IRB? We're doing only um, closed case reviews. And so from an IRB perspective, it's not a it's not an IRB issue, in fact, because you're not using any ID numbers. There's, um, you know, the subjects are anonymous, essentially. Um, if you're the staff member and you're removing the numbers, um, at the point I worked was Dwayne, and I don't know Dwayne's last name. Dwayne was kind of our IRB person here at Golden West. So as long as the I, I, as long as those numbers are removed. And the way that we conducted all of these studies is we put standardized instruments. So they're all reliable, they're all valid instruments. They were filled out by students either at the beginning or end of services. They were placed in the chart. So then at the end of the year for a records review, I can come back in the summer, pull that data with no docu you know, no IDs, hand it to a statistician who can run the data, give it back to us, and then process that in terms of our multidisciplinary team to discuss, you know, what what are the results. And I think in terms of a process, it works pretty well just because we have that academic calendar. If things are sort of in the chart from the beginning of the year while we're all, you know, working pretty hard, then you have the summer to do that records review and then get the articles going. It takes us a year to do a study. We're doing one study per year. And we, as a team, look at what we want to study. We implement those, um, you know, ahead of time again in the summer, choose those instruments so when students come back in the fall, um, that's the instrument we're going to stick with and that's what we're going to implement all year long. So that's kind of been our process and I think, again, just um, given that all of us are very busy, the idea of implementing research has to be doable. And if you don't choose something that's manageable for everyone to implement, manageable for those of us who are doing the data collection, the data analysis, I think the bigger issue is make it a kind of reasonable study. I mean, I, I chose three instruments last year and it was our multidisciplinary team who said like, whoa, pick one. Like, do the other two next year or the year after. And I'll tell you, it took a long time to collect that data. I'm glad I had one. So I think, again, everybody is able to um, add to what's the nature, how realistic is this kind of undertaking. And I, you know, for my take, starting small is a great place to start. Um, <clears throat> so today, what I have for you is the current study, because this is the one that's now under review, so I haven't had the opportunity to share this one. Uh, this one you can't access yet. Um, in the next, I would say, probably two months, this will be published. The first three that we did um, are prior studies. Those are all in print. You can access those. And with the prior studies, Rob and I are going to kind of work together. Here's the study. And then administratively, what did Rob do and how did that translate for our team? So Pat and Lori as well, because of the nursing and the office, office management, it really took a collective effort. And in fact, our physician is not here today, but even our physician was a part of the change process that came from this data. So when we really talk about administrative and clinical changes, that was our goal with all of this. What can we learn about our patients that would inform administrative and clinical? Um, clinical staff, you know, there were a lot actually in terms of changes that our psychologists made, um, very large. And I think in terms of nursing intake, again, very large. And just how we managed patients coming in, doing the research, uh, there were a lot of aspects as well. So um, current study, um, because, you know, we're not complete, we don't have administrative changes yet. The prior studies, you can really see how study one led to administrative changes, study two, more administrative changes, study three, more administrative changes. And I have every belief that we will also have administrative changes after study four is completed. Um, <clears throat> I think what's nice about uh, the invitation to speak today, Sally had asked, you know, share with the group 
what recommendations you have that could be useful because every college is different. The way that you offer your services is different. What we do, some might pertain, but some might not. So what are some tools, what are some research questions, and really begin the thought process if you are going to take a first step, what, what might be useful in your college. That, that's kind of, I think, um, critical as well. I'm happy you know, to answer any questions that you have about how we did something or why we did something or if it was legal even because we didn't have informed consent. That's important. So um, when you talk about something like Rob's study in contrast where you're looking at designing an instrument and giving it, now you're in that difficult realm because designing is you know, very labor intensive, five years, that is not unusual. It takes a very long time to standardize an instrument. Um, getting the IRB permission, how are you gonna give this to people that are real clients that now you know who they are in order to give them resources you would need to know who they are. So it adds another layer. And in part, those kinds of changes have to be built in. So when, you know, how can we collect data? It's because it's not a research study. This is part of our clinical care. We use that. So if we're giving a depression survey, that's in the chart. Therapists read that. We score that. We talk to our patients about that. So that becomes integrated into the care. It's not just, gee, let's find out how many people have depression. Let's find out you know, does this client have trouble sleeping? Do they have trouble eating? So it, it becomes part of the standard care, and that's part of how it's a different kind. It's a clinical process of research, not sort of the national research. Um, and that, you know, I think when you look at public health research where we want to know how many kids in the whole country are depressed, well, we're looking at, of the kids at Golden West who have depression, what are the symptoms and what kind of clinical intervention? And that one-to-one -one process, again, very meaningful clinically, you know, not hot research nationally. How much this is going to translate could look very different at different colleges. So I think just to give it a perspective, this is the type of research. And it is a more clinical, practical, decision-making research, not kind of a global kind of thing. And I think, you know, our population is very diverse. We are, in our setting, we're seeing it's about a third um, of mostly Vietnamese Asian student. We have about a third Latino, about a third white. In all these studies, you'll see it moving and changing somewhat, but that's a very diverse study compared to what would be in the rest of the state and even nationally. So the results we might get in this diverse community could look quite different in other places. So that's where you know we're always looking at, we would have to compare to a very similar college to see how those results may or, or may not fit. So I think in a general sense, uh, those are some of the thoughts that I would uh, encourage you as, you as you look forward in your own college. Um, the study that we did, um, Stages of Change in Therapeutic Alliance Among College Students Seeking Mental Health Services, and for us in our integrated health center with health and mental health, um, we train staff in motivational interviewing. Motivational interviewing is a technique that's designed to increase motivation to change. It's not actually how to change, it's like let's get you know, more interested in making the change. Then you may use whatever you like, cognitive behavioral, solution focused, whatever brief treatment that you like. Um, but if the motivation isn't there, then we don't see a lot of effectiveness with any of our strategies. So uh, motivational interviewing is not considered therapy. I've trained probation officers, I mean, many of the fields that are doing services that they're trying to motivate uh, to get outcomes. Healthcare workers, um, where they're, again, trying to influence people's health behaviors. It was designed for addiction, but it really has crossed over into many fields. So we chose that as a strategy. Um, the first chart audit showed that people were using all kinds of different strategies, but the evidence would really, say, would really say crisis intervention, problem solving, coping skills, motivation, cognitive behavioral, solution focus. But in terms of an average of four sessions, if you do lots of other types of treatment that can be quite effective in other settings, 
they're not as effective with college students. So that comes out of national data. So that's how we chose motivational interviewing, and that came first. So how do we choose our measurement tools? Stages of change is the way that you measure motivation. So you say, um, what is the stage that they're in, in terms of how motivated? Are they unmotivated about changing this problem behavior? Um, are they maybe thinking about it? Are they actually preparing and coming up with some ideas on their own, how to solve their problem? Or maybe they've actually taken action steps. We measured that before they started treatment, day one when they did their paperwork, then we measured at the end of therapy to see how far they came. Some of our students, you know, maybe they come in, they want to stop using drugs or alcohol. In four sessions, they probably won't succeed at that goal. But if they went from, I'm not interested in making a change, to, you know, I'm thinking about making a change, or maybe even I'm taking some steps, um, that would be good progress. So we measured pre and post on stages of change. The second measurement that correlates with Therapeutic Alliance is um, the idea that with motivational interviewing, you should develop a stronger therapeutic alliance. The motivational interviewing is really consistent with Carl Rogers. Um, so you know, you're looking at client-centered therapy, the focus on relationship. Why? The focus on relationship is the number one outcome. Clients come back to therapy if they have a positive relationship and their treatment goals are more likely to be met. So we thought motivational interviewing <clears throat> as our technique, stages of change as an outcome measure, therapeutic alliance as a post-test. So that's, uh, in terms of getting started on this study, that's what we were doing. Now I will tell you that was an ambitious study. Stages of change is 32 questions. It's a pre-post, you have to score that. <laughs> the, uh, you know, Therapeutic Alliance is, again, another pa paper pencil test, but that's another 12 questions that you score. So as far as studies that you're seeing today, this is the most complex we've tried. I like it, and I think it's a useful study. My co-author, Marilyn Potts, says it's one of our best, but I would tell you it was our hardest to do. So make your own decisions. You have that in your file as you know, one of the potential things you might think about using as an instrument. What did we find? The sample, um, in terms of our sample, we always like to compare to our demographics of our college to see how well we're serving the students that are diverse groups within our college. This year, the numbers I received are 15,798 uh, in terms of the general population of students. The breakdown was 64% male, 53 females, 1.9 African American, 27.5 Asian, 32.5 white, 27.6 Hispanic, multicultural 4.0. Uh, then we have unreported at four, but the, and then mean age 24.7. So when we look at this group, what we do is we compare it to who comes in for mental health services. So our mental health demographics, we had 130 students who came for counseling, 28% male, 71% female, 27% Asian, 18% Hispanic, 52% white, 2.6 other, and a mean age of 26. So when you look at that, you can see we have many more females in treatment, 71 compared to 53. So that tells us our outreach to men is not as good as it might be. But if you're a clinician, you may know that in general, men don't typically come to therapy um, as, you know, if you looked at it percentage-wise, you'll, any agency, you'll see more women than men. But it does have some, when you think about outreach, it does have some outreach implications for us. When you look at the demographics, 27% Asian in student demographics, we're at 27. So that's great, our outreach is good. Latino 27, Latino 18. We could improve on our outreach to Latino students. Um, so it gives you, you know, it, it, 
white is usually overrepresented, which I think it is with us, 32 as compared to 52. So what you're seeing is, it's again, because of some of the diversity research, other cultures are not as fast to come to therapy as uh, white. So the idea that we would have more white students isn't a big surprise, it's consistent with literature, but it does say that we could continue and particularly continue to reach out to Latino students. So the purpose of the study, we always want to describe who we treat, what type of treatment they receive. We want to compare these students to the health center uh, population with the general population of Golden West. We want to make sure that we're serving all of the campus in the diversity. We want to compare our current year <clears throat> to prior years, and that's the program improvement piece. Each year we've collected some of the same data, so we can look back and we can say we had a dropout rate, we made some changes, our dropout rate went down. We had you know, uh, a charting issue, charts were not consistent on a certain point or multiple points, we made some changes, now we go back and we check. Did the changes we made administratively affect the change that we needed in our services? Um, the study looks at the relationship between the therapeutic bond and treatment pro process, because really at the end of the day, are they getting better? And can we document that? I think many of us as therapists know our clients are getting better. We have a good sense of that. We're not as good at demonstrating it, showing it, having a kind of way to document uh, in a way that's objective. So in terms of the methods, <clears throat> this would be considered exploratory descriptive study, closed case review, the data uh, that was provided by university research is the university data. The treatment progress was measured by, it's called Eureka, it's a Rhode Island change assessment. You can get that on the web, but we've also given it to you. That's the pre and post test that we used. The therapeutic bond between clients and therapists was measured with a scale called Working Alliance Inventory. That's the one we used at discharge. And SPSS, Statistical Package for Social Sciences, was used to analyze the data. So the results of the demographics, you know, females being, um, in this particular study, the mental health students are female and they were slightly older. The whites were overrepresented. Um, the Asians were similar in both groups. The Latinos were underrepresented in the mental health group. Clinically, we like to look at the number of sessions and we like to look at dropout. Our sessions range from one to eight, but we call it zero to eight because our process is that nurses do an intake prior to the therapist's first session. So they essentially have two intakes, one with a nurse, then one with a therapist. For our decision making, we decided dropout is if they see the nurse and the therapist for assessment and they don't return. So essentially session zero and session one are both counted as assessment, so they would have to come back for session two to begin to be part of our count. They could come, again, the zero to eight. Um, mental health students, on average, 4.2 sessions. In this particular study, we had um, 11 as a range, which sounds interesting since eight is our number. Um, if we have students that are in crisis and they need uh, resources, they need additional crisis sessions, we will see them beyond the eight for the purpose of assessment and connecting them with community providers. So the way you get an 11 in a one to eight model is that there's your crisis session and that's not gonna happen but maybe once in a whole year. Um, in terms of the mental health students, we talked briefly, uh, Rob and I, and the idea why do the students come in the first place. Our students presented with depression, 24%, anxiety, 15%, and stress, 13%. Anxiety, stress, and depression is consistent with all the literature nationally for college students. So that piece is, I think, um, right on. Different um, you know, agencies might have slightly different percentages, but the fact that those are your top three reasons for students to present is clear. One thing we did different in this study, 
prior studies, we used therapist diagnosis to figure out what was the presenting problem, and we learned that therapists are a bit unreliable. Um, some of us like adjustment disorder with depressed moods. Some of us love depression NOS. Um, people have different ways using the DSM to call the same thing. So that didn't prove to be all that helpful. So what we did this year was ask the patient what was the problem. So I don't know, we'll give it a try, but it's interesting that when the patient decided the problem, it was really consistent with the literature. So that was, a sh that was a shift, and again, lessons learned. It wasn't until we got that first set of data, we got together with the therapist and said, gee, why are all your patients depression and OS, but all mine are adjustment disorder? How did that happen? So then we were able to kind of talk it through and figure out DSM has a lot of overlap, probably not a great research tool. Um, <clears throat> we looked at um, the dropout rate, 6.9% dropped out after the nurse intake, 18.5 dropped out after the first session with the therapist. This is amazing. Um, the dropout rate in many studies, in fact, some of our prior years was 25%. In fact, our first year was 44%. So the nurses would have lost 22, then we would have lost 22 as the therapy team. So 44 of our patients never got past intake. To get it down to 25% from 44 is really terrific. But what was outstanding and amazing, I've never seen a 6.9 dropout rate. So as the nursing team moved forward with some of the motivational interviewing, as they expanded their intake, as they added goal setting, as they began to essentially begin that treatment process, they're getting 6.9 dropout rate. If they keep this up, the therapist might be out of work. I don't know. They're doing better than we are at the moment. Um, students, they reported the therapeutic bond um, with this uh, working alliance inventory, a mean of 77 for women and 80 for men. This tells us overall, um, you know, these are very high scores. So our students, again, pretty typical college students, they come in, they're motivated, you know, they're high-functioning clients. So they're, you know, they bond, they can make relationships, they bond pretty well. So um, we're getting good scores on that. Students did show improvement. We looked at the action stage from the Eureka, which says, are you taking actions to solve the problem that you have? We looked at action stage from intake, action stage from discharge, and we got a clinically significant number, which was great. So we really can demonstrate um, with a reliable tool that our clients improved. The students who reported having a stronger therapeutic bond with their counselor also had higher levels of treatment progress. That's amazing too, because to be able to demonstrate that if your clients have a better bond with you, they also get better. Um, so I think for us, it's a pretty exciting study because much of what we hope for in therapy to be able to really document that your clients make a bond with you and that they improve and that they stay in treatment. These are all things that we hope for, um, but to be able to demonstrate that I think was really exciting. So, you know, in terms of what did we learn, what's our takeaway? The outreach definitely could improve in the areas of coming up with strategies to let men and Latino clients to be, you know, available to those groups and find ways to reach out. Um, the total dropout rate of 25%, um, <clears throat> that was excellent. We probably want to look at the therapist dropout rate, because to tell you the truth, I don't know why uh, it was 18. 18 is not bad, but um, we always look to see. Last year it was 15, so why is it 18? I don't know. Um, the study findings are consistent with the literature. Clients who have a strong therapeutic alliance are likely to stay in treatment and have positive therapy outcomes. Using the motivational interviewing by nurses, therapists is consistent with other, other studies that have seen positive outcomes with mental health in school settings. There's actually a whole book right now on mental health in uh, school settings, which is interesting. It's like a 2014. Um, before I go on to prior studies, because this one 
um, had a lot of pieces to it that I think had implications for both our office management and also nursing. Um, maybe Pat and Lori, do you want to add any comments about changes that you feel contributed to these results? Just real briefly, one aspect that I loved, along with the motivational interviewing, is something that I have never thought of verbalizing with a patient. Maybe everyone else has, I don't know. But um, when a student does come and see us and say they want to see a therapist, we go over why they want to see a therapist, we get background, what have they tried so far, and again, this form will, will be in your, on your flash drive. But um, the part of it that I have never thought of before, and this is lengthy, you know, quite a bit after the, the uh, assessment or, or um, intake, is we, tell, we ask the patient, or tell the patient, after all of this, you know, when their, their uh, appointment is and so forth and so on, is, you know, I'm really glad that you came here to ask for therapy and to ask to talk to someone about this. I, we always tell a coworker, man, I'm glad this person came to see us. But do we always verbalize it to the patient? And Chris, with her motivational interviewing and helping us uh, uh, come up with this RN intake, that is huge. And I use that in many other aspects when I when I see a student. It, you know, we think about it. You know, if, if they're ankle is four times what it should. Man, I'm really glad you came in here. But do we verbalize that to them? And that, to me, is the biggest part. And, and sometimes you can see a nonverbal with the patient as well. When you tell them that, you, you just kind of see, man, she gets it. You know, she, she's glad I'm here. I'm really glad I'm here. What a match. You've destigmatized coming in as well. Yeah. All right, hey, we have a question here. Yeah. Um, hey, Chris, I just have a question. You know, many of our students are coming for truly short-term issues, situational crises, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And from the patient's perspective, once they've seen the RN once, and then once they've seen the therapist once, you know, as far as they're concerned, they've had two mental health visits. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, you know, how low can you really go? Is it really, really a treatment failure if somebody drops out after one RN intake and the one therapist visit? You know, as far as the student is concerned, it may be a success. You know, that's an excellent point, and that's a problem, honestly, with the research. That's one of our limitations. When students don't come back, we call it a dropout, because that's all we know to call it. But in reality, if they did have something that either the nurse solved for them so they truly don't feel like they need anymore, or one session with a therapist, they feel like they got what they needed, in our records it looked like we failed them. And there's no way at the moment with this data to separate out who felt that you know, the problem was resolved. And then college students, there's kind of a third group. Some of these problems resolve on their own. You know, they have a breakup, it's a crisis, it's awful. We get them in, they say, oh, we got back together. And like, I don't need therapy anymore. And that's, you know, pretty typical that some of these problems do resolve. So when we look at it, the only measurement we really have is that they didn't come back. And when you set a cutoff, we really do believe that the first two sessions are about assessment, so they really haven't carried out a treatment plan that we've developed. But it's a really good point. It's a really good point. Are we sort of maybe judging ourselves too harshly? Maybe they got what they needed. So if we can figure that one out, that would be important because we have that as a limitation, honestly, every time. It's a good question. Pat, were there, oh, okay. I want Pat to get a chance for her part too. Okay. Um, we made changes that helped out with our dropout rate. Do you remember what some of the changes were that might have been helpful? The first thing is when they come in is they express a desire to seek counseling or seek mental health. And immediately what we do is we just go ahead and give them a sheet of paper that lists all of our appointments available. We ask them to highlight the times that they are available so that they know that it's, it's doable. And, um, either set them up with a therapist if it's 
if they can get in right away to one of the, or in other words, if a therapy session is available in an hour, we'll have them see the therapist. We prefer to have them see the RN as far as the motivational interviewing the first intake, but sometimes, occasionally, not often, but the, they do see the therapist first. Then afterwards, they will come in for a brief session with the, um, the nurse just to go over the contract and you know, give them resources and things like that. So, okay. Just real briefly, okay. one change we did make is um, we call them the day before uh, if they have a nurse, if they have an appointment over 45 minutes so with the nurse or the therapist. Not once they're in the system, we don't remind them of their therapy. But oh, we do. Oh, sorry, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Cats being modest, when you think about the student walks up to the desk and says, I want to see someone with no help, that's huge. And so that person greets them. And doing the scheduling is huge, too. We have a waiting list. There's a lot of juggling. Uh, so the front desk is a key person. Then the nurse gets them and do motivational interviewing. And then they tune that up. And then when they get to the therapy, good things happen. So it's really a team process. And I also want to add, our doctor is not here today. She's actually working in the clinic. She's very shy about Brandy, but she treats uh, anxiety and depression by prescribing medications. We thought not too many people did that, because somehow we think we're acute care and into chronic. But then when we looked at some data, we saw about 30% of other health centers do the same thing. We go, oh, we must be doing good stuff. So there's another angle. We haven't talked about the doctor's role, but some of our students without that medication, they wouldn't be successful. They would drop off. So with very strict criteria, we will prescribe medications for some individuals. Not all, but some. But there's another facet to this team, and the doctor isn't here today, so I just want to add that. short gap, they should be getting insurance, and that, but it's when they've been dropped from their insurance and the other hasn't kicked in yet, so again, short term. Okay, Stephanie. Also, it's less stigmatizing to get medication for many people than to actually go see a therapist. Yeah, Chris, I um, sort of had a thought when I was um, looking at your, um, some of your uh, data related to the um, diversity of the um, sample. Right. And, um, you know, with, as with a lot of studies, they focus on uh, ethnic diversity. Right. And um, I'm really glad to see the center here um, represented. Thank you so much for coming. And, um, you know, I, I'm sure all of us in this room uh, were here because we are passionate about um, trying to help our students be successful, but we also have an interest in probably um, some experience in um, mental health issues. And so it's no secret that our LGBTQ community suffers um, uh, disproportionately uh, from mental health uh, conditions and all of the ones that are the conditions that are um, represented here, uh, depression, anxiety, stress, and, and also um, um, high proportions of, of suicide ideation. So what struck me was it would be a really interesting follow-up to this study um, to be able to um, identify students who self-identify as LGBTQ to have some of the similar da data and compare it mm -hmm. um, to students who um, you know, are uh, straight, for example. Um, and and the, the good news is, is I think that's possible to do because actually as a system, we are moving to a new um, application through CCC Apply that's going to allow students to self-identify their orientation, their gender expression, and gender identity. And so that would be really, I think, a really interesting follow-up mm -hmm. to this, um, to, to be able to assess a specific population of students um, because I, I just, you know, anecdotally, I, I, I have a feeling that um, a lot of that, a lot of those numbers are going to be high as well. And that's it, would help, it would help us. It, just sorry, just to, just to add, it would help us as a college be able to figure out how to target services for that population. 
It's a really good point. Um, we haven't yet done special populations. All we've done is like the whole, you know, kind of mental health population, which our sample is pretty small um, at 130, and then compare that uh, to Golden West. A couple of things that would be um, challenges, we'd have to kind of figure this out. Our clients self-report their ethnicity, but they don't self-report their sexual orientation. Certainly, we have gay and lesbian clients, but it would be reading their charts and pulling that information out of a chart. It wouldn't be really on any data that we collect. So that's a little interesting. Right. Mm -hmm. So then if the school is going to begin collecting that information, then I'm assuming we would have access. So this would be helpful to look at some special populations within your health center. Now, of course, I'm going to challenge all of you, because if you give me a small sample and I already have a small sample, I need your data, because I can put it all together. Should we have, you know, 50 students, 30 students, I don't know, from every college? But if I look at my sample, I'm going to get something pretty small. Yeah, we have gay and lesbian clients, but out of 150, I'm not going to get a sample size I can work with. So that's going to be our next task, is to kind of begin working together. Um, I think, you know, the important part of the whole implications is just that, you know, accountability is key for administrative issues. The chart audit is one way to provide continuous feedback for program improvement. In addition to reviewing the current program services, we've also added new services where we discovered service gaps. So I think it does inform us about what we do, but I also think um, it informs us um, in terms of uh, gaps for future, something like the medication where we discovered we didn't have a way to make that happen in the community, so our physicians stepped up to do that. Um, I wanna give you just the highlights as far as what we found in study one, two, and three, and what we did about it, because I think we talk about research in terms of what can be gained, but I truly can tell you, if it goes in a journal somewhere, four people read it. Literally, we know this. A lot of people are not gonna read it unless that's something that is right, what you need for something you're doing at the moment. What matters with this data collection is does the manager use it? If you're not gonna use it to influence your services, you can collect data, and researchers do this all the time, Agencies, they have piles of data, and you say, what did you find? And they say, we never run it. We have this data, but why are you collecting it? Well, we're mandated to collect it. Nobody mandates them to run it or mandates them to make informed decisions. So I think it's really critical to have the two together. If you're gonna do the research, have a mechanism to get that feedback and make those program changes. We talked about collecting a baseline and really that's just looking at the charts you have and seeing what they are. There's no research questions because this data is whatever, whatever it is. When we did our baseline, one of the things we really highlighted was a high dropout rate and I would say pretty lacking in terms of charting. Um, we didn't have diagnosis consistently in every chart, didn't have measurable short-term goals, didn't have active interventions, didn't have client response to treatment, and didn't really have case disposition of what happened to these folks. Now, I say consistent. Yes, these things were throughout the charts, but what we're looking for is that consistency that every chart would have. Um, in our case, we we're kind of looking at Medi-Cal standard, a little bit more specific documentation that you could you know, find in every chart. So that was one of our things, and the high dropout rate did concern us. The administrative response. Um, we initiated uniform charting expectations. We don't have forms per se, but every therapist now includes those items. So whichever chart you would pull, that's now included. Is there a question? Thank you so much. I just have a question for you. Are you using electronic medical records or paper no. charts? We're, we are using paper and pencil. <laughs> or those of us who type on computer, we print it and put it in the chart. No, we're pretty small, and we may not, I don't know if everybody else is on medical records, but we're, some are, some aren't. Yeah, so in time, yeah. Okay, um, 
The, dis the follow up calls for case disposition, uh, our nursing um, you know, staff has made calls so when a client doesn't come back or the case closes and we don't know it was not a planned termination, that call is made so that we can close the case, do referrals, or at least document that the client doesn't need services. We did do the motivational interviewing to get consistency among providers and the staff supervision about the deficiencies. So to make sure everyone was on the same page, we had some in-services for the psychologist to kind of all agree what would be the standard for charting. The nurses changed intake forms um, and our staff who works the front desk made reminder calls as well. I felt that I just needed to add this too, is that what we did is we implemented a deposit which means that if they didn't show up for their therapy session or they canceled the same day, things like that, then they would lose their deposit. It's only a $10 deposit, but we keep that through the eight sessions. If they keep their eight sessions or they just, after six, they don't come back or whatever the case may be, they'll get their deposit back. I've noticed that when I get phone calls from clients that say, you know, I don't think I'm going to be able to make my appointment today, I say, Okay, well, I need to remind you that you will lose your $10 set to ten dollars deposit. We'll need to get another $10. And the session will also count. And they'll say, oh, okay, well, I'll come then. Okay, good, thank you. And again, these, this is consistent with literature. If you make follow-up, you know, make those phone calls to say you have an appointment tomorrow, the literature is really clear, you'll lower your dropout rates. So it's, you know, very consistent and it worked. We, our dropout rate for our second study, the replication, went to 25%. After we made those changes, we went from 44 to 25. So I think it was really clear that those changes were helpful administratively and, um, you know, very much measurable. Most charts by the second review had diagnosis, goals, treatment plan, active intervention. So we do have charting that reflects the care. The interventions were evidence-based practice. They were clearly documented. In this study, we looked at outcomes as did the client think their goals were met, not met, or partially met? Uh, and we had a symptom checklist. So what kind of symptoms were they endorsing pre and post? Again, as another way to document patient improvement. And with all these, um, you know, you have a lower dropout rate. What does that mean? You serve more clients. With the same staff hours, we served 146 clients up from 118 last year. So it really, it's not only better care, it's sort of better utilization in general of the services on campus. The administrative response, of course, we're throwing a party now, right? <laughs> Everybody's really happy because we got some great outcomes. So um, we did identify two gaps, so the medication evaluations and we had no groups. So out of that study, we began um, with short-term medication assessment with our doctor. We also tried a veterans group and we also tried a nurses group. Both, I would say, moderately successful. We had trouble finding times when people could consistently be there. Um, the nurses who came, the veterans who came, I think were happy with what they received and yet we didn't feel like it was sort of made sense because it was a lot of staff time to run a group and we really didn't have the participation we had hoped. Um, the third audit, this is amazing to me, our dropout rate dropped even further to 15.9. So we went 44 to 25 to 15. And I know it can't be zero, but it's going in a really good direction. So I was very happy last year. We served 132 uh, students. We gave them a satisfaction inventory, a client satisfaction score out of a possible 32 we had 29.79. So you can see that our clients are very satisfied with the services. Um, the students needed help with positive coping skills. Um, we used a coping strategies indicator that looks at avoidance, it looks at seeking support, and it looks at problem solving. And our guys were pretty, you know, okay on support and okay on, um, you know, seeking support, but not, 
you know, the problem was they were high on avoidance. And that's things like substance use, not, you know, doing other distracting things, but not actually solving your problem or getting help. So what we learned out of this study is we do, as a campus, need to focus on teaching coping skills. Now, the third audit, um, the efforts in reducing the no-shows and cancellations is holding, as seen in the low dropout. The documentation continues to be complete and accurate. We've started, Rob and I, doing coping skills lectures in um, specific individual classrooms. So we're invited to nursing, we're invited to different, um, kind of different places on campus that we have relationships. But the overall takeaway is we need a larger platform to teach coping skills to the larger student body. So that's the piece that we haven't yet implemented, but I think the study really clearly demonstrates that the coping skills uh, could be built into classroom orientations, other ways, uh, so that it's not a one, you know, as Rob and I do this, it's, it's yes, helpful to the 30 people in front of us, but we've got 15,000. So, okay. Again, tying into the big picture of student success, they talked about every student needs a student education plan. We say every student needs a life plan. How do they balance school, work, and family? That student success score, that's kind of the baseline. So Chris and I can go out to the classroom and talk to 30, 50 kids at a time, but we need some mechanism to help students identify their needs and the resources. So that's why the idea of a life plan, as long as a student education plan, would, would be a mechanism to do that. Okay, so kind of in summary from the aspects that we've discovered, the audit provided in information about service gaps, areas in need of improvement. The staff received feedback that leads to improved patient care. The program improves by ensuring that services offered are current and evidence-based. The students benefit when we monitor client satisfaction and ask for their input. So when we look at it in terms of where we've been, um, we would say, here's some recommendations as you go forward. Having useful research questions that are meaningful to your setting, practical instruments and surveys that really can be, I would say, paper and pencil conducted by students so you're not using staff time for some of these more elaborate uh, types of instruments and using the research questions that you feel are really going to be key to improving your services. So a first step, take a baseline. If you haven't taken a baseline, even pull a sample, a small sample of your charts. Look at the number of sessions that you've you know, provided to students in the year. Look at the demographics of who you serve, the number of sessions per client, the dropout rate, the number of service hours provided overall by the clinic. Those are some really nice baseline statistics that you can then track year after year. In terms of comparison, you can compare, again, the mental health students to your college to demonstrate that you're serving your campus. You can also compare your data with prior years to monitor your program improvement. You can also compare your data to other colleges to learn from each other. I really recommend standardized instruments. It's very difficult if you're asking questions that no one else is asking on their survey and you know, the idea that you're making up something about client satisfaction when there's already a well-documented client satisfaction survey, um, I'd really encourage you to focus your attention on ones that are already in the literature, standard reliable instruments. Um, I think checklist is the easiest way to go because it's less time for the student and less time for the staff. The type of research questions, I think client satisfaction is a very good place to start. Client satisfaction is a good measure. Patients, you know, if they don't come to treatment, they're not going to get better. So we need them to come to treatment and we need them to stay in treatment. And the idea of, you know, satisfied clients will come to treatment and that's what's going to help them uh, accomplish their goals. Therapeutic alliance is also the good measure. 
Client satisfaction is eight questions. Therapeutic Alliance is 12. So just to let you know, they're really pretty straightforward instruments. We know Therapeutic Alliance correlates with patient's outcome. So it's a good one to start with. Measuring outcome, you could use a pre-post test or you could just use you know, a test at the end. Either way is equally good. If you want to look at you know, alliance or satisfaction, that's a really good post test. If you want to look at did they improve the idea of the symptom checklist, which I think is also like 10 questions, it's a small one, um, or the Eureka, the 32 question, a little more challenging, but the pre-post does give you that kind of information. The question is, you know, what about specific aspects of your program? And that's where, you know, when we had done the group for nursing students or the group for veterans, if we had a specific question, could we look at were our objectives met that we had set out for those groups? You could do that. You could ask open-ended questions. What two new things did you learn from the group? If you're not looking at your whole you know, population that you treated, if you just want to look at a group or you just want to look at one aspect of services, you could go sort of a qualitative where you ask people specifics so you could take their feedback. Um, what about certain types of clients? Um, if you wanted to look only at depressed clients, how well do we treat depression? Only at anxiety. Um, what you could do is do a specific test just for depression and again you could do a pre or post on that. In terms of future research, clinical outcomes that are specific and standardized, um, if you wanted to say okay we kind of looked at more motivational interviewing, if your um, providers are doing a different type of therapy, so maybe they're solution focused or maybe they're crisis intervention, maybe they're problem solving, you could take one type of intervention and then measure that and see what kind of outcomes that you're getting. Um, larger sample sizes to multiple sites. The generalizability is always a limitation to these small studies. It's a small study at one school and every journal will tell you that. <laughs> you need bigger samples with multiple schools. Um, in terms of um, looking at the next year, we're looking at the PHQ-9, which is a public health questionnaire with nine questions. And it mostly measures depression but we're giving it to mental health clients as well as health clients. So they could come in with you know, a cold and we're finding out 15% of them have depression. Then we cross refer from the medical side to the mental health side. This is our first study to actually look at the health and the mental health, not specifically the mental health. This is the one where I would say, if you're interested in participating, this is a very straightforward study that you would give clients um, you know, the nine questions, and you would send it in without names or identifying information, our statistician would be happy to run it. So if you would like to participate in this study, that's our current study. Okay, I'd like you to take maybe just three minutes and share with your group one thing that you might take away that you think could be useful. If you were going to do some research, what might that first step be at your college? Yeah. <laughs> uh, at Santiago Canyon College, we just started doing the PHQ-9 uh, last semester with our, a pre and post. So before intake, they complete it, and then towards discharge, we do it again. Um, so that's something we just started doing now for two semesters. and. I'd like to maybe contact you regarding that study because that's something Great. we would be definitely <laughs> interested in. We did the NACCHA as well. Um, and I know that we were also talking about in DSPS a different type of evaluation or assessment that would look just brainstorming about questions. <coughs> we were just talking about how we just really need to do, you know, chart audit, hopefully over the summer. So we're starting at the total beginning. Okay, so you just heard five years of research in an hour. So <laughs> my question is, uh, do you have any questions or any comments that you wanted to add? Um, I would appreciate it. Okay.
Um, you know, getting back to Stephanie's comment about getting the LGBT and gender um, information from CCC apply, there actually are um, several data points that come in on CCC apply that we're not able to pick up because we don't have a banner report mm. that will then pick that up and put that into that student's banner data, hook it in. So what happens is it doesn't just have to go on CCC apply, it ha we have to, as a district, persuade somebody to um, write the code to tack it on. We do not collect the, we get the data in CCC apply of whether someone is a veteran, but the only veterans we really know about that we can find um, are the ones who are certified currently as uh, GI Bill. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's good. Sylvia, I'm glad you brought that up. Just curious, how many of you, your database, do you have banner at your college or some other system? What we're talking is, you know, how do we do admissions and records? You know, how do we track the student data? Well, there's a software system, we have to use a banner. Now, we will also have electronic health records, which would make this a lot easier, but those two systems have to talk to each other. But I will share with you, we did make an attempt to look on Banner and look at student transcripts and look at their GPA and look at did they continue. Now those are two big things for student success. Their grades, did they continue, their persistence. So we need to connect to that academic success. And again, our hypothesis is healthy students learn better and stay in school. But we gotta access the data. So that's a challenge. You know, that's a um, good, Point, and I didn't mention that from our first study, Rob and I went in and got all the GPAs of the students and compared it to the on campus. If you look nationally, the data says that students who in mental health care have lower grades, which would make sense that they're struggling. Unfortunately, our students did better. <laughs> didn't help our journal article. We don't know why students struggling with stress, depression, and anxiety somehow seem to do better in school. Um, the reason I tell you that is as a caution, a couple of things that could explain it. We only have students for sessions, so the odds of seeing improvement in GPA or frankly even drop, we don't have them long enough to where GPA is really maybe going to be d demonstrated. I think that was one problem we had. The other problem is we tried to look at dropout. That's really hard. We found out that a, there's no real record on that that when students don't come back, they might have gone to Orange Coast, they might have gone to a four-year school, we don't know where they went. The school really doesn't track other than the ones who are specifically transferred, but students stop out, so they might miss a semester, then come back, so they're really not a dropout. There's a lot of reasons why it's difficult, unless you were to like do a phone kind of deal where you called people and really said what happened. At this point, I can tell you because we wanted that data really badly and we couldn't use it. It was like not good enough to use because we already knew um, from the statisticians here at Golden West that they just had no good way to do it. So that I think ultimately it would be wonderful to be able to tie GPA. It would be wonderful to be able to tie what happens to these folks. Do they drop out? Because as I was doing literature review for this study, there was a NAMI quote that said like 25% of the people who drop out is because of a mental health reason. I didn't use it because it wasn't, you know, exactly in a source where I knew for sure. Um, but I can tell you that makes sense to me, but it was very hard in these studies to be able to get our handle on what's happening with our students. Just, okay. just real quick, um, when you do bring up motivational interviewing to your staff, be prepared because it, I and the other nurses said, what, this is therapy, we have to do therapy. Um, but when Chris said, you know, she teaches this to probation officers, well, heck, if they can uh, do the motivational interviewing, certainly the nurses can. So um, just be aware of that. You, you may get pushback, but it's like, you know, anything else that's new, you feel like you're all thumbs, but after you do it for a while, you, you get more comfortable with it. And the other aspect I wanted to mention is 
the intake forms that we use and some other ones are on your flash drive. And so after this, and you go and you look at it, if you have any questions, feel free to give us a call if you have any questions on those. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Take care and good luck.